plastic reconnaissance boat battles against what are possibly the most dangerous rapids on any river in the world. The three men in it represent one fiftieth of the total members of a jumbo-sized expedition that cost 135,000 pounds. Included, giant inflatables capable of carrying 30 men. Specially designed rubber boats called professionals that could be rowed through white water. Small recce boats driven by 40 horsepower engines. And jet boats so powerful that they can climb up the side of a deep whirlpool as if riding a wall of death, and in one case actually had to do so. It included, too, a beaver aircraft for dropping supplies, eight Land Rovers and six Range Rovers to support the main river party and the scientific elements of the expedition. These experts included biologists engaged on fish and other zoological research, botanists. One of their concerns was the choking spread of water hyacinth along the river. Then there were the eye specialists, perhaps the most important and worthwhile part of the whole exercise. Servicemen from three nations, including engineers. All this weight of men and materials to conquer a river that was first discovered and navigated exactly a hundred years ago. That river, once the Congo, is now called the Zaire. The vast Republic of Zaire, formerly the Belgian Congo, takes its name from the river. The Zaire is 2,718 miles long, placid for much of its length, but punctuated by four appalling areas of rapids some with standing waves 40 feet high. The man who first saw and navigated the river a hundred years ago, American journalist, geographer and explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, leader of the 1874 expedition. The leader of the present expedition, a Royal Engineer Major, John Blashford Snell. Having completed reconnaissance of Red Gorge and Paddington Falls. Over. General Roger, what is your ETA, my location? Over. Niner. Blashford figure Snell is no stranger to complex and hazardous exercises. In 1968, his expedition became the first to navigate the hazardous waters of the Blue Nile in Ethiopia. In 1971, he led the first expedition to cross by vehicle the 300 miles of swamp and jungle between Panama and Colombia, called the Darien Gap. Now he was leading the largest and most ambitious project of all, following in the footsteps of H.M. Stanley. The river runs north in a great loop, crossing the equator in two places before entering the sea at Banana. Blashford Snell's men aimed to start at the very top of the river, where the Zaire was known as the Lualaba. Stanley marched overland from Lake Tanganyika and joined the river 600 miles further north, near Nyangwe. Setting out from Zanzibar in 1874, Stanley intended to cross Africa from east to west, settling en route all the remaining geographical unknowns. It was a quest from which few expected him to return, and some openly hoped he wouldn't. Three years before, he had already become a world figure by finding Dr. Livingstone at Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika. Stanley wrote his account for the New York Herald. Many explorers regarded finding Livingstone as a journalistic stunt. He reached Ujiji again in 1876. There, he dismantled his sectional boat, the Lady Alice, and marched across country to Nyangwe. Escorted by the notorious Arab slave trader, Tipu Tib, and 200 of his men, Stanley set off overland, rather than follow the winding course of the river Lualaba. Oh, 
The appalling task of dragging the Lady Alice through the forest soon became daunting. After 17 days' march, during which they covered 160 miles, Tipu Tib's men turned back. Stanley finally launched the Alice on December the 28th, 1876. From the start, the 2,000-mile journey was one long horror. All told, Stanley fought 31 battles with natives along the banks. Cataracts were even worse than he feared. Fourteen men were drowned in them. His total losses from fever, hunger and fighting were 165, including three white companions. Early on, he nearly lost one of his most faithful followers, a veteran called Zaidi, who had served with Livingston. Zaidi became marooned on a small rock after his canoe had overturned. He had to stay there all night until rescue could be organized. Within 50 miles of the town of Boma, close to the mouth of the river, he nearly gave up hope. Eight men had recently died from starvation. He sent four picked men ahead with written messages. Within three days, porters arrived with mules laden with food, and Stanley was saved. With 115 survivors, all in fearful condition, he arrived in Boma. At last, the world was to recognize Henry Morton Stanley as a geographer and explorer of the very first rank. It was to mark the centenary of his great feat that this very different expedition set out in November 1974. The boats started as near to the source of the Zaire as they could get. Lashford Snell's Zaire River Expedition, ZRE for short, consisted of several separate elements. The river running party tried out their rowing technique in the professionals in some early minor rapids. To the rowers who had learnt the use of oars in white water under American Ron Smith, veteran of the Colorado River, this was child's play. Lashford Snell had chosen these rapids as an early shakedown for what was to come. Jim Masters, veteran of the Blue Nile, was under no illusions about what might lie ahead. Nor was nurse Pamela Baker. She'd been on a previous mountain expedition in Jamaica. Roger Chapman had faced the Blue Nile cataracts and had dropped by parachute onto an isolated plateau in Guyana. These were all old hands. By marching the first few hundred heartbreaking miles across land, Stanley had avoided these early cataracts. Stanley's decision was a wise one. It's unlikely that the Lady Alice would have coped with the conditions. He'd probably have had to carry her in any case. Oh, Easy. Nothing, really. Still okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
As leader, Blashford Snell had more to worry about than the river. He'd had to organise an expedition that was spread over an enormous country. 600 miles away in the capital, Kinshasa, ZRE's eye specialists were preparing to set out into the virtually roadless interior. Their objective? Villages badly afflicted with the disease known as river blindness. Then there were parties of entomologists and zoologists to be dropped off and supplied. All this had had to be planned and coordinated like a military operation. The supply system, like a good deal of the expedition, actually was a military operation. The boat crews entirely depended on the forward support teams to meet them at selected points with fuel and food. Often this meant hacking away in through the bush to find an unnamed rendezvous on a far from complete map. Just imagine what it must have been like for Stanley, who had to carry all his supplies with him and when these ran out, bargain with hostile tribes or in cases where he was attacked, take food by force. Not that ZRE had an entirely trouble-free passage with villages along the river. Memories of white mercenaries during the Civil War were still fresh. Fortunately, ZRE had Zaire army liaison officers with them, though even these were arrested on at least one occasion. If trouble with riverside villagers could be avoided by diplomacy or a show of strength, trouble with the river itself could not. The Red Gorge lay three days ahead. There, as air reconnaissance by the beaver made clear, the river was showing its muscles. Stanley missed out this part of the river, though it may have been less hostile in his day. A hydroelectric scheme has diverted part of the Zaire through this terrifying gorge. When the expedition reached it, there was too little water in it, exposing the rocks and making it exceedingly dangerous. Blashford Snell was able to persuade the engineers to let more water through the dam, raising the level for a few vital hours. Even so, it was a rough ride, and only part of the gorge could be navigated. Conditions at Paddington Falls are impossible. Figures three zero foot vertical drop. Water in gorge is insufficient. Am ordering portage. Over. Piano, Roger, I will inform all those who need to know. Have you anything further for me? Over. A niner, yes. Inform call sign three to move as planned in the east. I say again, inform call sign three to move again as planned in the east. Over. Zero, Wilco, over. And Ina, that is all, out. They had now been on the river three weeks and were into fairly calm waters again. They were still 300 miles south of the point at which Stanley first saw the river, beyond the next series of cataracts called the Gates of Hell. These threatened to be one of the worst obstacles so far. The small dinghies couldn't serve to get the river party through the gates. Just ahead, at a place called Bukama, something far bigger had been brought in by the support teams. The three giant inflatables had been specially designed for the Zaire River. The design was largely the result of experience by the American experts who had made river running through the Grand Canyon on the turbulent Colorado almost a matter of routine. There was certainly nothing turbulent about their maiden voyage on the Zaire. 
Wisely, Blashford Snell and ex-Royal Marine Captain Michael Gambia, commander of the River Party, had chosen Bukama because it lay at the head of a placid, lake-like stretch running for 120 miles through swampland. It was an ideal reach of the river for the 20 men aboard each craft to get used to living on it. For the helmsman to get to know the steering characteristics of his two engines. For the captain to discover the best trim for his inflatable. And where gear should be stowed to give the best handling results. Such factors would be crucial when they met white water. In five days, they were through the swamps and approaching a village called Colombo. The support team reported that the headman and the villagers were well disposed, despite the fact that they too had vivid memories of white mercenaries. All misunderstandings had been ironed out, so Blashford Snell decided to show the flag ashore. We've now reached the village of Colombo after a slightly epic night's journey. And I propose this morning to do a number of things. First of all, the botanists will be going to the lake to look for papyrus with a boat of Alan Davis's recce section. Another party will be going inland to look for primates and also to examine uh, some of the insects in the swamp behind us. And I shall be taking a third party to the village together with Queen Cesar, that's our buggy, uh, to... Um, see what we can do to help medically. There was no river blindness in this particular village, but plenty of minor ailments that never normally received medical treatment. The boat party's New Zealand doctor, John Chapman Smith, walked in with Canadian Douglas Newby. Nurse Pamela Baker, who speaks fluent French and Swahili, acted as interpreter. The whole rather bizarre encounter was conducted much as in Stanley's day except for the fact that transistor radios continually blared music from Radio Kinshasa. Next day they sailed on schedule, the river running due north, 150 miles towards the gates of hell. The beaver was called up to make a last minute check on the water conditions in the cataracts there. Flying downstream to meet the boats, the pilot passed over the wide swampy areas the inflatables had just navigated. He found the river party tied up in one of the few calm stretches of water they'd see for some time. The cataracts following the gates of hell are nearly 200 miles in length. Soon he passed over the first of the rapids, white water broken up by treacherous rocks.
no rapids looked quite so terrifying from the air. Nevertheless, there was quite enough here for the river party to be concerned about. First of all, I'll give you the general plan, and I'm not going to talk in very great detail about the move through the gates of hell, because you've heard the, the problems of the ground ahead. All I want to say is do not underestimate it. You may think that it's going to be a doddle and it's going to be easy, but I think you'll find there will be one or two quite nasty surprises in that water, and it's certainly as difficult as I want it to be at the moment. So don't go in thinking this is something where you, can, you, need, you won't need a life jacket or a crash helmet. You probably will need both. Now, the recce party uh, under Alan are moving off this morning to mark the way through the gates, and we shall be leaving tomorrow, and I want everyone, please, ready to sail by 0830 hours, and that means on the boats, uh, with engines started and skippers reporting, please, to me 15 minutes before. But they weren't able to sail for the gates of hell quite as planned. Next morning, a typical rainy season storm blew up. They'd chosen the rainy season deliberately, so that there'd be as much water in the river as possible. Such violent storms soon pass. Meantime, another sort of storm was threatening. Zaire Army liaison officers suggested that an issue of arms might be advisable, as a friendly reception along this stretch of the river couldn't be guaranteed. Though there were one or two close calls, fortunately, the arms never had to be used. And 97875. Who's next? 95. Right, right. Roger. What's for you? Uh, 9 millimeters. Roger. 9 millimeters. Cameron's. Nice. Okay, Senoritas Caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. Just feeling a bit bloated. I get that sometimes. Now I'm eating one of these Activia every day. It contains something called Bifidus digestivum, a unique culture from Danone which is clinically proven to help improve your natural digestive transit when eating every day. Activia, actively good. Mmm, Danone. Win two seats at this year's best British events with Cadbury Dairy Milk. At the gates of hell, as the ancient wrecked paddle steamer shows, the Zaire River was dangerously low. Despite low water, which exposed dangerous rocks, conditions were unexpectedly nearly perfect. The dreaded gates of hell turned out, despite the leader's warnings, to be a bit of a double. The flagship did a circle or two, she wallowed once or twice, and then took her crew of 15 safely through. Perhaps at other water levels, the gates might have proved far more hazardous, but no one complained about that. There was plenty of white water still to come. Stanley had first glimpsed the river after his overland march from Lake Tanganyika, north of the Gates of Hell. He turned away and continued his march, 
escorted by the slave traders Tipu Tib and his men for another 60 miles or so, and then launched the Lady Alice and her accompanying flotilla of canoes. Now, for the first time, the expedition was sailing where Stanley had sailed. Crowded as the inflatables were, Stanley and his companions would undoubtedly have regarded travelling like this as a luxury, with nearly 1,500 miles of river still to be navigated. Meantime, a vital part of the expedition had arrived at its objective. They'd made a gruelling overland drive from the capital, Kinshasa, to a village near Kananga. Early reports had suggested that onchocerciasis, river blindness, existed mainly in villages along the Zaire River. In Kinshasa, the team of eye specialists had learnt that the blindness was most prevalent not along the Zaire itself, but on some of its tributaries, including a river called the Lubi. The team led by Freddie Roger included 12 international eye specialists. Four British, a Dane, a New Zealander, two French, two Belgian, and Zairois doctors as observers. There were many cases of river blindness in the village. That of Kamba in Tumbo is sadly typical of the disease in an advanced stage, as Freddie Roger explained. The case of Kamba in Tumbo is a sad one, but he's not the only one blinded by river blindness in Africa. There are said to be 20,000 people infected by the worm which causes this blindness. And a very high percentage, it is said to be in the region of 2 million of this 20 million people infected have become blind. This region is not too bad. Uh, one might ask, what is river blindness? Well, it's caused by the bite of a little black fly called the buffalo gnat, which breeds in fast-flowing rivers like the Luby in this area. And uh, it implants in man small baby worm, which advances into a large worm, and these worms breed a type of worm which doesn't grow into an adult in millions. This small parasite creeps through the skin and it's called a microfilaria and it grows not at all but it multiplies and will ultimately reach the eye. And the extraordinary thing is that nearly everybody in this particular village where Kumba in Tumbu lives is infected and has these microfilaria in the eyes but there is not a high proportion of blindness and most of the people seem to be living in perfect unity if not amity with the parasite present in their eyes this is an extraordinary thing and is one of the reasons why we came to investigate it so you've got in the case of river blindness a fly vector and you just need to look around at this country to see what a tremendous job it would be to control the fly vector which spreads from 15 degrees north to 15 degrees south. And then you've got the worm inside the human body and you've got the human reservoir and the human tragedy. When Stanley launched the Lady Alice on the Congo River in 1876, he started on a calm stretch, but this didn't last for long. He soon met his first major obstacle, which he called Stanley Falls. A copious note-taker, he made rough sketches for this drawing of the native fish traps there. The traps are still there today. The fishermen use exactly the same methods that he witnessed. It took Stanley seven days to navigate the seven cataracts of the falls named after him. With the inflatables, ZRE took half the time.
first, the beaver had a look at conditions in the cataracts. They appeared really rough. The wrecky boats went through first. The giant inflatables followed. This time, to be on the safe side, they'd rigged their side tubes for added buoyancy. Once again, they were through quite safely, with the buildings of the modern town of Kisangani coming into sight. They had now been travelling north on the river for nearly two months and had covered roughly 1,500 miles. The expedition was just north of the equator, the river turning westward for the first time, with still 1,200 miles to flow before it reached the sea. Stanley had faced attack by hostile tribes all along this stretch. The river's reputation for hostility to intruders had survived, in one respect at least. ZRE's main enemy was sickness from several virulent forms of malaria, as well as from jaundice. Out of 150 members of the expedition, 114 became ill at some point, some seriously. Several had to be evacuated by plane or vehicle. Apart from all this, one of their main enemies during three weeks of confinement on the inflatables as they chugged down a hot, uneventful river was boredom. They waited eagerly for the next set of rapids that meant they were approaching Kinshasa, the capital city of Zaire. The date was December the 22nd. They had reached Kinshasa in 10 weeks. Stanley took many months to cover the same distance and without any modern conveniences. Nor did he find a civic reception waiting for him. In his day, Kinshasa was a collection of mud huts. He marked his arrival in the area by naming a large lake through which the river flowed just above the town, Stanley Pool. At Kinshasa, the inflatables underwent a refit. So did the Beaver reconnaissance aircraft. By far the most difficult stretch of the river lay in the 250 miles between Kinshasa and the Atlantic Ocean. Everything had to be in top form for the worst rapids they had yet faced. It was in this stretch that Stanley finally abandoned the river and came close to death from exhaustion and starvation. Immediately below Kinshasa, in the big Kinsuka rapids, the inflatables hit it very rough indeed. The long focus lens has a tendency to flatten out the waves, but some of them were 20 or 30 feet high. they'd been joined by a team of jet boats from New Zealand. Enormously powerful, these literally squirt themselves along by pumping water out at great pressure. They were able to go where even the wrecky boats were helpless, searching for the best passages through the cataracts and standing by for rescue work if necessary.
The giant inflatables had so far coped magnificently. But at a critical moment in the worst of the rapids, a steering motor broke loose aboard the flagship commanded by Michael Gambier. It slashed through one of the stern sections, losing the raft critical buoyancy. Michael Gambier decided that if anyone had to go overboard to lighten ship, it must be the captain. Luckily, one of the jet boats was able to dart in and pull him out of the water just in time, while a second jet boat took the stricken draft in tow. Between Kinshasa and the Atlantic Ocean lie nearly 200 miles of continuous cataracts, including a fearsome stretch above and below the Inga Barrage, where a hydroelectric dam has recently been built. Downstream, the Zaire River at last flattens out and becomes navigable for its last 100 miles, with a deep water port at Matadi, then on to Boma, where Stanley arrived more dead than alive at the end of his journey in 1877. The river finally meets the Atlantic at a town with the unlikely name of Banana. Stanley was forced to portage the Lady Alice round most of the rapids that lay ahead. The cataracts above the Inga barrage proved some of the most intimidating, with 30 and 40 foot standing waves. The recce boat's job at all such trouble spots was to look for a tongue of comparatively smooth water that would see the big boat safely through. These hazardous explorations frequently discovered among the terrifying smother of white water one or two glassy glides on which the giant inflatables could survive. The Zaya River had saved up something really nasty until right at the end. A huge bend filled with rocks like dragon's teeth, over which the white water foamed. The only possible time to navigate such an obstacle would be when rains had raised the water level so that most of the rocks were covered. Now the river was far too low. There was only one way to get round this, to haul the inflatables out and carry them just as Stanley had carried the Lady Alice at this point. Unfortunately, the rocks didn't confine themselves to the riverbed. Rocky outcrops blocked the only feasible route by which to carry the boats to the next stretch of clear water. Lashford Snell is not a royal engineer for nothing. Stanley believed in the use of force when all else failed, but even he didn't actually get around to blowing up the landscape.
Compared with the Alice, portaging the giant inflatables was comparatively light work. In all, the expedition only failed to navigate seven miles of the river from their launching point. Often, the small recce boats were able to pass through cataracts that defeated the giants. They were now close to the Isangila Rapids, at which Stanley finally abandoned the Lady Alice. We have decided to leave the river, he wrote, as it is not in our power to continue the warfare longer. As a final gesture, he had the Alice dragged up on top of some rocks overlooking the rapids that had defeated her. There he left her to bleach and fall apart in the sun. Carried down the rough track the engineers had blasted, the giant inflatables were able once again to join the river. They were in the home strait now, the Kisi Rapids, and after that, the port of Matadi and Calm Water. Even at the last moment, they had their problems. One of the recce boats overturned in a deep whirlpool. The crewmen were only saved by the quick action of a Royal Marine, who took his own recce boat in at great risk to himself and pulled his companions from the water. Such was the power of the river that the wreck boat only reappeared again a thousand yards downstream. For his action, Corporal Neil Rickard received the Queen's Gallantry Medal. Part of these rapids, the giant inflatables negotiated fairly easily. Fifty miles from Burma, Stanley prepared to die if supplies didn't reach him within five days. Fifty miles from Burma, Blashford Snell needed supplies too. He called up the beaver on the RT. A smoke float went up. A rock going in midstream, about 200 meters down. A flare was fired. And the beaver came in to drop its last load of fuel for the boats. From here on, the trip became an enjoyable cruise on navigable water, a time when Carolyn Oxton, who'd worked with the River Blindness team, could relax and take pictures. The flotilla cruised in good order towards the deep water port of Matadi and onwards towards Boma. 104 days after they first launched the boats, they'd navigated the entire river. They'd done it without losing a single man, though it had been touch and go at times. The general public may be excused for wondering whether the expedition was more than a splendidly organized jolly, whether assembling all that manpower and hardware was rather like using an elephant to crack a groundnut. What is John Blashford Snell's answer to this? Well, the first thing is, of course, that Stanley could not actually carry out any scientific research. He hadn't got any scientists. And this is a vast country, a gigantic country, and much of it is covered in tropical rainforest. And I think to put the whole thing in perspective, we've got to remember that the start of this expedition was a scientific research project. And we found that by using the river, we could actually get through the country. There are very few roads and very few railways. And so the whole movement plot depended on being able to use the river as a road. Now having said that, the next thing to remember is of course that to get down this river needed a certain amount of technical skill and technical development of a special type of boat. And so you needed engineers, marines, boat experts, white water experts to actually do this. Because no one, not even Stanley, had actually got down this river before um, and go through the rapids. And so we hoped that by navigating the river, we would enable our fleet to move through, enable scientists to hop on, hop off, and to work at the sides. So it was really an exercise in mobility. 
but what, in such a short time, had been usefully achieved in a medical or scientific sense. If anything can justify such an expedition, it must surely lie in these directions, rather than deeds of daring do. The scientists feel that they've been able to study the flora and fauna of the river in a way which would otherwise have been impossible, simply because, without the expedition, they couldn't have got there at all. Freddie Roger speaks for the River Blindness Team. There is no cure for river blindness. The only way to approach this problem, which affects 20 million Africans and has blinded 2 million according to the World Health Organization, is to control the fly vector. So the idea of taking a team of mixed specialists working on short time in a crash program into a very difficult country, collecting 100 factors from each patient, both blind and non-blind, is a good one because it had never been done before. And we hope that when the material collected is computed and the factors in the blind compared with the factors in the non-blind, that we'll find some other approach to preventing at least blindness in the case of this disease. That in itself has two or three side effects that are all heading in the right direction. First, it indicates to the world that this is a disease that deserves more attention. And secondly, we have demonstrated in practice that a multidiscipline, short-term survey is a practical possibility. And thirdly and lastly, we may achieve an answer. Each of these people is obtaining material from these men that we are examining that can supply information to the Zaire government in areas that they don't have this information, areas of endemic disease. So we can give the Zaire government a tremendous amount of information that they can utilize. And I think at the same time, by going out into this vast country, we have indicated to the Zaire Ministry of Health what a tremendous problem they've got. And I'm sure they will get more support in future to cope with some of the problems that we have highlighted. As the giant inflatables drew into the last landfall at Banana, the village close to the mouth of the river, their crews had the supreme satisfaction of knowing that they'd made it. But what else had they made? Certainly not history. H.M. Stanley made that 100 years previously. Nevertheless, Blashford Snell and his men had brought off a superb piece of organization and improvisation, and they delivered their scientists to their chosen centers of research. <laughs> the actual value of the medical and scientific work will not be known for some time. As the expedition ended, it was sufficient for most of its members that they'd survived the worst the Zaire River could do to them. This was cause enough to bring on the dancing girls. After this enthusiastic African welcome, there was the more restrained reception given by President Mobutu Sese Siko of Zaire at his palace. In 
1975, two things happened to put Zaire on the map for most people in Britain and America. One was the Muhammad Ali Foreman fight. The other was ZRE's fights with the Great Zaire River itself. ZRE also scored a diplomatic success at a time when any bond with African nations is extremely valuable. After the celebrations, all that remained to be done was to sail the giant inflatables down to the mouth of the river and out into the Atlantic to complete the obstacle course that had defeated everyone who had previously attempted it, with one notable exception, Henry Morton Stanley. <laughs> 